we're talking about teams, and obviously complex matters include internal and external resources. Can you tell us about how you vet potential providers for outsourced services? Sure. Level Legal was thrusted upon me, actually. Client wisely chose them. And I'm so grateful to that client forever. Grateful, truly. Sometimes that happens. We don't have a choice. And sometimes that works out. And sometimes it doesn't work out. Luckily for us at Level Legal, uh, you were going by a different name then. That worked out splendidly. But I actually take the opposite approach from where I would encourage associates who want to get to know me or work on my matters, knock on the door, send an email, cold outreach. I actually don't like that from vendors. There's just too much coming at me, quite frankly, and I'm not special. They, they come at all, anyone in a, in a firm. So for the vendors, I really go to, has somebody at the firm used them? Somebody at the firm who I know well or has good recommendations, more of that type of introduction is much better than in a cold call. That's just been my experience. And then again, this is similar to the associate, right? If you do a great job that one time, that first time, it sticks, right? So we should always be striving to do our best work for a variety of reasons in terms of a vendor. One bad project manager, which I've never had at Level Legal, I have not been paid to do say any of this. This is all <laughs> my own personal view. I'm not speaking for the firm, just speaking for myself. I've never had a, a bad experience with any project manager or anybody at Level Legal. But I have worked with other vendors in the e-discovery space and experts, for example, and it's hit or miss. And all it takes is one miss and you never want to use that vendor again, even yeah. though they may be a great vendor. How confident do you have to be in a vendor for you to recommend it to a client? Highest recommendation is I've, I've personally used them, obviously. And then I'm one of those people, this is my way in life. My husband always says, he always prides me on this. If you do a great job for me, whether it's as an e-discovery vendor, whether it's as a waitress at the restaurant. I go out of my way, if you do a stellar job, to call you out. And if you do a bad job, I also go out of my way to make sure that's known. <laughs> Let's just put it right. that way. I'm an equal opportunist. And for me to recommend someone to a client, the top is if I've worked with them and, and, and I can give my own. Otherwise, sometimes there isn't somebody at the firm who's worked with somebody and it's a bunch of vendors the client has told us to consider. And for cost reasons, we need to go with somebody I've never worked with, but is dramatically less money. And I just try my best to, to vet them. And part of it's a gut feeling. It's just like yeah. interviewing anybody. Are you connecting with people? And if you can find that people are connecting with you on a personal level, we spend a lot of time on these cases. I'd much rather spend it with people that are enjoyable to engage with than maybe they're experts, but they're like really difficult to work with. We talked a lot about the hub and spoke model. What kinds of teams do you recommend that model to? I think it can work in any legal context. Obviously, as I mentioned, I think earlier, the hub and spoke is that kind of model is important for large matters, particularly matters. And these are the matters that I tend to work on where you've got an intersection, parallel proceedings, right? You may have a securities litigation and an ongoing criminal regulatory investigation, right? And so you need to be making sure that you really have an eye on everything and there's lots of moving parts and how is one decision we make over here on privilege going to impact the potential litigation down the road, but oh, it would curry us favor with the government if we were able to tell them this information. We just need to be able to think through all those different kind of, if I do this, then what's going to happen here? To me, it's certainly these large matters that have 10 plus attorneys and staff working on them. Certainly, um, I like to think of matters in that way. And as I mentioned, in that scenario, you do not want to be a single hub. You want to make sure you have at least more than one person in the hub. But I think smaller matters where it's just a partner and an associate, obviously this model is not really relevant. It's really about teams. Any matter that requires more than two or three people, I think it's also important. When I think of a team, it's more than just the attorneys. It's the assistants who help the attorneys that can help us on the matter. It's the paralegals. It's the level legals and the expert firms and the trial graphics firms and the jury consultants. And yeah. I could keep going on and on and the court reporting. So it's all those people as part of the team. What's really unique about law is we have clients that will have like project managers they're a company selling widgets, right? But they've got a project manager in there whose sole job is to move, make the trains move and organize people and make sure people are talking. Law firms aren't set up that way. So you need to develop attorneys who have those skills, who are able to manage people, manage vendors, manage the support staff 
and also deliver legal strategy, legal skills. So I think it's an important skill. It's one, again, I've said I, I pride myself on, but it's not for everybody. Some people really yeah. prefer to just be writing a brief in their office on their own, and that's okay. But for larger matters, you need to make sure you're including uh, attorneys on your team who have this skill set.